My name is Jonathan Foote and I'm here to talk about securing C code that seems to work just fine. I'm a principal security architect at this company, Fastly. So I've been there for a couple years um, and I'm going to talk about Fastly and use it as an example uh, throughout the talk just because it's where I currently work. But I've had exposure to um, C, uh, C code that seems to work just fine in high growth and optimistic environments throughout my career, uh, working as a consultant. Before that, working as a security research lead at uh, SCI at the Carnegie Mellon University, and before that, as a software engineer at a big uh, engineering company. So, to jump right into using Fastly as an example, Fastly is a high growth tech startup. So, it started off as something called a content delivery network. And so, what, what that means is when the company was starting, um, they went and they put these like, small and mid sized server clusters all over the globe. They're, they call them points of presence or POPs. And they were using kind of a crazy architecture. So they were using low-cost SSDs, um, low-cost networking gear, as opposed to like the big iron that's really expensive. They were using these Arista switches that ran the Linux kernel. Um, and so they're doing some crazy stuff, and it, it worked. So the company started to grow quickly. They were getting customers even faster than they expected. And as the company grew, this is a common story, um, they started to add more features. At this point, they call it an edge cloud because there's so many features you know, running in these points of presence around the globe. They started to have more uh, types of customers, so big customers, small customers, um, you know, from a lot of different countries. Um, and of course, as the company grew, there are more and more engineers committing code. And this is kind of the story of Fastly, but it's a pretty common pattern for high growth tech startups. I mean, it's a good thing. I'm thankful for it. I have a job, so that's cool. Um, and it's thanks in large part to this idea of optimism. So the dictionary says that optimism is hopefulness and confidence about the future or successful outcome of something. Um, the guy in the background here is Dr. Daniel Kahneman. Um, he wrote a book back in 2011 that uh, dealt with optimism and a whole bunch of other topics. And he won the, the Nobel Prize actually for economic sciences back in the early 2000s. And so this is a quote from his book. I'm just going to read it. Optimistic individuals play a disproportionate role in shaping our lives. Their decisions make a difference. They are the inventors, the entrepreneurs, the political and military leaders. They got to where they are by seeking challenges and taking risks. So optimists play a big role in our lives. Some other interesting insights from his book. Um, basically, he found, you know, looking at um, scientific studies, some of which he was involved in, that entrepreneurs have more optimism than average. Um, and you know, to go along with inventors and leaders and so forth. So startups tend to be you know, more optimistic organizations. And one thing I thought that was interesting here uh, from his book as well is that optimists inspire optimism in others. And I think it's really important in high growth startups for this to hold because in order for high growth startups to grow, they take venture capital or investment money. And in order for that to work, the investors have to think, hey, that might actually pan out. I should give them my money. And optimism helps carry that forward. And, on the technical side, I think that holds as well, like in staffing. So if you're an engineer looking for a job, you have to think, wow, that seems cool. Uh, that seems like, you know, that could pan out. I want to go work there. And so optimism is really integral to high growth startups uh, succeeding. And the other point I thought was interesting here was that uh, Dr. Kahneman found that optimism actually provides advantage, some advantages over fully rational thinking in some cases. So like fully rational thinking is, you know, weighing in the costs and benefits carefully. But actually, optimism wins out in some cases. And one of the reasons that is is because optimism prov um, provides resilience. So when you fail, optimists tend to persevere. OK, so these are some non-controversial ideas about high growth startups. Basically, um, how they operate is they tend to take risks, um, you know, try to do something crazy, kind of like Fastly did. And you know, hopefully, it pans out for the high growth, high growth startup. But sometimes they fail, and they need to persevere through those fails. Failures, excuse me. So that's how they operate. They take risks, they make mistakes sometimes, and then they kind of persevere through them. And so now I'm going to subtly segue to talking about the C language to change gears a little bit. So um, jumping back to uh, using Fastly as an example, when the company was you know, bootstrapping, they started putting these small and mid-sized server clusters all over the globe, and more and more customers started to use them. One of the key engineering trade-offs in um, implementing and operating an edge technology is this trade-off. There's an inherent trade-off between performance and isolation. So you can think these are small and mid-sized server cluster, uh, clusters around the globe. They're serving hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of customers' uh, web traffic. Um, 
And so they need to scale, but then also every customer that's running there, they have to feel like they're the only one in that location. And so, uh, you know, dealing with this trade-off is one of the things that comes up a lot when you're working in edge technology. And Fastly, like a lot of other companies in this space, started to deploy high-performance proxies and servers in these uh, server clusters. And these high-performance proxies and servers are often written in C, just as they are in many other places. Uh, you know, the, C is a language that you go to frequently when you're trying to deal with these tight engineering constraints. So what makes C code special? So I'm going to talk a little bit about C and the history and, and stuff like that uh, to, to kind of lead up to what makes it, you know, both interesting from a security standpoint and also, you know, why it can satisfy these engineering constraints. So C was invented in the 1970s as part of implementing the Unix operating system. It was based on this uh, language B, which was typeless, which kind of uh, shows through a little bit. And I was searching for some text about the spirit of C. Uh, you know, so like I searched the web and I came across this, uh, I was looking for text from this book, The Rationale for C, and I came across this 1988 uh, copy of PC Magazine. So like um, in the late 80s and early 90s when they were publishing this book, C was really taking off. They also kind of marketed it in this magazine. And I just wanted to show the cover of that because it gives you an idea of what the environment was like. Like the community was super psyched about 25 megahertz processors being widely available. So this is what the world was like kind of when C was coming of age. So uh, regardless, this is some text from that book, The Rationale for C. And uh, it kind of sums up what C is all about. So I'm going to read a little bit of it. Some of the facets of the spirit of C can be summarized in phrases like trust the programmer, don't prevent the programmer from doing what needs to be done, Keep the language small and simple. Provide only one way to do an operation. Make it fast, even if it is not guaranteed to be portable. And so um, while C was you know, kind of invented in the 70s and came of age in the 80s and 90s, um, it remains a super popular language. So this is um, a snapshot of the TO Bay uh, survey of popular languages or language popularity. It's a pretty good, good reference for this sort of thing. And, you can see C is in the number two position, and it's been there for 15 years and counting. So it remains a very popular language, and for good reason. It's a very powerful language. It's really versatile, um, and it's ubiquitous. So most operating systems have support for C. Whoops, excuse me. OK, so one of the ways that you can shoot yourself in the foot with C is this idea of undefined behavior. So undefined behavior occurs when a C program executes code that is not defined by the language standards. And so at that point, the program is allowed to continue execution. And so what this means is any uh, properties around security and safety, kind of all bets are off. Um, and as an example of when this went awry, excuse me, back in 2015, uh, Joshua Drake, who's a security researcher, found a vulnerability in this media parser called Stage Fright. I'm sure people have heard of it. Like, uh, what happened basically was an attacker could send a crafted media file to an Android device and then own it. So in the case of an MMS message, an attacker could send it to a victim. Victim didn't need to take any, any action. They could take control of the handset and then potentially send it to all of the victim's uh, contacts in this kind of worm. And so it was a really kind of like catastrophic failure. Everyone was in an uproar and it was, it was a problem. So to look down at what happened in the code here, if you check out line 10, you can see that this buffer is getting allocated on the heap. And this value chunk size gets added to size. Well, it turns out the chunk size is controlled by the input file. It's, it can be controlled by the attacker. And so what can happen here is if chunk size is large enough, it kind of overflows uh, the, the range of values that are valid for the type. An integer overflow occurs, which is a kind of undefined behavior. So if an attacker supplies a large chunk size, the integer wraps around, and the buffer that it gets allocated winds up being really small. And so then if you look down on line 12, um, data, which is also controlled by the attacker, gets copied into that small buffer. So then heap, uh, heap buffer overflow can occur, can be exploited to get code execution. And then with some privilege escalation, you can own the handset. And so this was a pretty ca catastrophic failure. And it was like, it's pretty subtle. You know, when you're thinking about the volume of C code you have to deal with, it's hard to catch this sort of thing. And so as, an excuse me, as a testament to how difficult it is to get this sort of stuff right, here was the first patch that went out. So if you check out line 10, you can see a developer added a check to try to make sure that uh, chunk size is reasonable, but it is also uh, susceptible to undefined behavior, unfortunately. So if chunk size is really big, it's going to wrap around, integer wrap around is going to occur, the check is going to pass, then you're going to, uh, execution will proceed to line 13, and basically the same thing will happen again. 
So, so it's hard to get right. And uh, there's some really good write-ups on this on, uh, online. This one is from the uh, Google Project Zero blog, which I think is worth checking out. So anyway, the upshot here is that very subtle issues in C can cause catastrophic security failures. And of course, this is just one example of many that have happened over the years. So if we put together this idea of high growth startups, taking risks, making some mistakes, and then trying to persevere through them with how, you know, what happens with C code, basically what we can conclude is that high growth startups that use C take risks, but then they're gonna make catastrophic security mistakes, and then they're just doomed to failure. And I would make a joke about my talk ending here, because that's all there is to it, but we're short on time. So uh, obviously this is not the case. Um, uh, but there are some unique challenges to securing C in a high growth environment, in an optimistic environment. The good news is that there are a lot of uh, useful C tools out there. One of the cool things is because C has been around for so long, there's a really mature ecosystem of tools. There's actually a bunch of really good curated lists of tools online too. I listed a few on the slide. Uh, you can Google for them, there's a bunch more. Um, I wanted to make a note here, like if you work in application security, you probably talk to a lot of vendors. And um, in some cases, uh, Excuse me, you know, it's difficult to find vendor tools that actually solve your security problems, but in the C uh, space, there actually are some really good, robust ones out there. Like, if you've ever tried to write a static analyzer against Clang, it's possible. You have to write some C, C++ code. You have to compile Clang with debug symbols, probably, and you can do it. It takes some time. It's even harder to get developers to do it. Um, but meanwhile, you know, you, if you go to certain vendors, you know, you can find static analysis tools that have a UI for defining rules and refining them and stuff. So there's some good ones out there. Um, but there are also some really great open source tools, and I wanted to call one out here. So um, one really useful tool is uh, this thing called Clang, which is a front end for the LLVM compiler. So Clang supply, supplies a framework for a whole bunch of uh, useful security tools, and what you see here is um, an example of something called undefined behavior sanitizer. And I called it out here because this addresses undefined behavior, which is one of the reasons that stage fright came to pass. So, if you check out the pseudo, or excuse me, the code for in the before section, you can see integer addition, kind of like we saw in the vulnerability. And of course, wraparound can occur, and um, undefined behavior can can manifest itself. What UBSAN effectively does is it adds a check before the addition occurs to see if the undefined behavior is going to going to occur. And if it does, um, it's just going to exit. It's going to error out and give you a useful backtrace. So the upshot here is that Clang provides a common integration framework for a growing number of security tools. And of course, there are a ton of open source, excuse me, good open source tools out there. But I think Clang, you know, if you think about the amount of time that you have, excuse me, to deal with security issues in a high growth startup, um, it, it's worth considering for, uh, from a strategic investment standpoint. It provides a really like, if you have your project building with Clang, you can add certain compiler flags, certain linker flags, maybe link in another library, and you get a, you know, a new security tool. So there's a whole bunch of tools in there, and they tend to be on the bleeding edge of usable security, which is nice. So at Fastly, for example, we've made, this has been a really big win for us. So this is an example of a project at Fastly where we build uh, production versions of it with GCC because we've done a ton of performance optimization to make sure it runs super fast uh, in production. But at the same time, we also, as part of our CI process, we build it with Clang, and we build it with a whole bunch of different sanitizers. And so, as an example of this working out for us at Fastly, like you can't merge a PR without um, building both with GCC and Clang and passing this big battery of integration tests. So it's really saved us a ton of pain on the security engineering team, but also just on the development and uh, SRE teams at Fastly. So this has been a big win for us. Uh, and I recommend, yeah, like, if you're thinking in terms of investment of your time, it's worth checking out Clang. So, um, I, I keep using this word investment, and I think it's important uh, when you're in a high growth environment, um, in an optimistic environment, to really think about all of the security controls in your SDLC as investments. Because once you put something in place as a gate your developers have to go through, you basically have to support it indefinitely. And when you have very finite resources and you know, a lot of competing priorities, it's important to really be uh, choiceful in what you're going to, uh, excuse me, choosy in what you're going to, uh, to implement and, and, and roll out. And so, one of the kind of problems with using a traditional SDLC in a high growth environment or a DevOps environment is that it isn't always a perfect fit. So, um, you know, the, the older SDLCs, um, you know, they've been updated, but they were kind of originally based on this idea of like a box product model where you build something, you secure it, or excuse me, yeah, you build it, you secure it, and then you ship it. And when you're in a DevOps world, code is shipping almost all the time. So the idea of doing like a final security review or fuzzing before releasing doesn't really make sense. 
And so in response to this need, um, coincidentally, yeah, in response to this need, uh, the Slack team, Lane Ari in particular, um, started to publicize this idea of a self-service SDL. And so the idea is um, you build kind of automated tools for your developers to use uh, as part of the SDL so that they don't block on security and it frees up time for you. So the developers are less frustrated, you have more time to you know, build other services and so forth. And we thought it was a pretty cool idea. So Fastly, um, Lane and Ari were nice enough to spend some time with us and describe how they did it. We actually implemented something like you see here, this is a self-service risk assessment. Brian Adeloy, who's the AppSec lead at Fastly, built something like this for us. And we thought this works really cool, excuse me, this works really well. And it, it has really helped us kind of keep our hands around risk at Fastly. So we thought it was a pretty cool strategy. But um, the truth is, uh, at a high growth tech startup, there is like a massive volume of stuff you have to do. So this little, this chart is just the most, 50 most recently used repos at Fastly. I just charted the number of PRs over time. And you can see it's kind of an exponential growth. Um, so there's a ton of code flowing in. Uh, in addition to like code flowing in, there's also a bunch of new tech. So people are using new frameworks, they're using new languages. So it's enough to keep you super busy. And of course, it's hard to find good AppSec engineers that can both do application security work, they can do specialized work like C, and then also build security services. It's just a hard thing to do. And so, um, you know, this is enough to keep uh, an AppSec team extremely busy. So one of the things that's actually going on kind of inside all that code that's flying through your, uh, through your pipeline, excuse me, uh, it often is, is this idea of a minimum viable product approach. And I don't know if this is like the most modern term, I'm a little out of date on process stuff, but the idea is that developers are often kind of like building something, just enough of it to see if it's gonna work, and then they ship it, and then they try to gather feedback to see if they can iterate on it or if they should just drop the project altogether. And so yeah, they're trying to collect the maximum amount of validated learning from their customers as they can with the least, with the least effort. And so it's kind of a uh, process of develop, ship, learn, and then iterate. And so um, at Fastly, for example, like on the AppSec team, when we were like, you know, just getting barraged with a lot of work to do and kind of, you know, dealing with uh, new technologies and things like that. And we, we also knew that we wanted to build self-service security for C projects, but we just didn't know, you know, how do we make time to, to make that investment? And so eventually it had dawned on us, like, well, we can kind of use that tool for ourselves. So we could try to use an MVP approach for automated, automating security services. And so I'm going to talk about an example of doing that uh, here in just a minute. I'm gonna talk about doing it for this thing called continuous fuzzing, and I'm gonna give a little, a little background on fuzzing to start, and then maybe tell a story. So, um, this is not a talk on fuzzing. It could be, you could do many talks on fuzzing. This, hopefully this is just enough fuzzing to understand what's going on here. So, fuzzing in a nutshell is you start a program, or reset its state, you feed some random input to it, and then you look for misbehavior. So often in the case of a program written in C, you're looking for a crash, and it works really well. Um, that's basically why it's so popular. Uh, code that behaves well under fuzzing is usually code that's already been fuzzed. So to tell a little story about this, back in 2015, shortly after I joined Fastly, I was trying to figure out a way to expand fuzzer coverage inside some of our server code bases, and I read about this experimental, then experimental feature in American Fuzzy Lop, which is an awesome fuzzer, um, called persistent mode. And I figured out how to apply it to the server code bases, and I was doing it on my own time, so I tested it out against Bind, which is this ubiquitous DNS server. And I almost immediately found a critical vulnerability. And we were phasing bind out at Fastly, um, but that's, that's the code base I wanted to work on. And so I found this critical vulnerability. Um, I worked with the vendor to you know, coordinate disclosure. They took my fuzzing patch, started to fuzz their own stuff, found their own vulns. Other security researchers started to find vulns and you know, um, work with the vendor to disclose them. And so it's like, this is going awesome. I had these ideas. I was talking to my buddies. I'm like, we're going to fuzz all these other code bases. You know, this is going to be really, really powerful. But then like, I got really busy. Uh, and I just kind of stopped doing it. And like, um, I'd, I'd be lying if I said this wasn't the first time I did this in my career, where like I would go uh, really gung ho about fuzzing and then kind of run out of energy. Um, and I don't think I'm alone. So like, across my career, I've seen a lot of instances of this. It's what I call heroic fuzzing. Like, someone gets inspired to do fuzzing. It could be a security engineer or a researcher. Maybe they found a new technique, like I did, or a new code base or something like that, or an attack surface. Then they fuzz it until they find bugs, which almost inevitably happens. Uh, you know, they work on fixing the bones and they're gonna fuzz less interesting code paths in the program and you know, maybe expand to other code bases, but then eventually they get busy and the fuzzing stops for whatever reason. Maybe the box they were fuzzing on, you know, they'd use it for something else or 
the upstream developers change the code base so that your fuzz harness doesn't compile anymore, and you just, you just never get back to it. And I want to mention that like, while this happens you know, a lot and it's not perfect, you don't really get security assurance over time, it is a really good thing that fuzzing happened at all. But it is a problem. You don't get security assurance over time. And so in response to this, um, the team at uh, Google kind of pioneered this idea of continuous fuzzing. And so the idea is that project developers really own the fuzzing integrations. They're the ones that are writing the integrations. You always target those fuzzers against like the latest or you know, release candidate version of the project, and you run them continuously on dedicated infrastructure, beefy infrastructure, like a cluster or something like that. The bugs get reported back to the developers, and that way security can really focus on providing a good integration framework um, and uh, running the infrastructure and also supporting developers. And so um, this solves a lot of the problems with heroic fuzzing kind of intuitively. One interesting note here is that um, because fuzzers have, excuse me, you're empowering devel developers to write fuzzers, you can potentially require them to build them as part of the SDLC, which is something we do sometimes at Fastly. So this is definitely a best practice. There's this awesome project called OSS Fuzz out there. If you're using OSS, I would recommend checking it out. You get Google, the team is, has been really great to work with and they give you a lot of compute resources for fuzzing. Um, but then the question is, what do you do for um, continuous fuzzing of private repos? And so this is what we were working on at Fastly. Basically, our focus was an MVP approach and we really knew that um, Getting something usable was the really hard part. Like, I've actually built fuzzing clusters before in my life. It's actually really fun. But getting something that developers would use, it was the hard part. So we're really focused on that. Um, and so what we ended up doing was really uh, leveraging OSS fuzz. We basically copied their program and, and hacked some of the bits to make a fuzzing cluster. We ran into a few problems, though. Uh, the three main problems were that we needed to access private repos. We needed to maintain progress between the fuzz runs. And then we also knew that we weren't gonna have as much automation as the OSS fuzz team did. And so we kind of um, you know, addressed these in an intuitive fashion. Because we are still running this thing manually, we knew that we could just forward an SSH agent in just like you would if you were cloning a private repo as a developer. So we kind of, we did that. We hacked the OSS fuzz code base to maintain progress between fuzz runs. And then of course, to this day actually, I log into the fuzz server on a daily basis and make sure it's not on fire. And of course, I look for crashes and stuff like that. And so I like the Wizard of Oz analogy, you know, the pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Um, so this worked well for us at Fastly. Um, we've found, you know, high and uh, critical impact bugs and, you know, caught some of them before they go into production. We've also, one cool thing that happened was in our uh, public integration for H2O, which is an HTTP2 server, the ngHttp2 team took our seed files and used it to find bugs in their project, which I thought was cool. And also our internal continuous uh, fuzzing server has been a pretty useful proving ground for uh, testing out fuzzer integrations. So, right, so I don't want to give the impression in any way that this is done at Fastly. Um, we started out, uh, you know, with training earlier, working with developers uh, to understand if it would work for them. We had some labs, some of them went well, some of them didn't go so well, but it really was kind of, um, you know, it's, it's a continuing effort. You know, it's, it's not done, but we are finding high and critical impact bugs and it's working for us. So, so I think it was a worthwhile endeavor. So it did address our resource, um, our resource constraints you know, to some extent, but of course, it didn't solve our problem completely. So I'm gonna talk quickly about this idea of server security, which I think is another important component to securing C code you know, in a high growth optimistic environment. So traditionally in AppSec, and throughout my talk at least, I've really been focused on code. But what we're really interested in is code that runs on infrastructure that's operated by engineers in some environment. <clears throat> so the idea here is that the thing we really want to secure is the code in flight, not the code in place, of course. A while back, I came across this paper by this guy, Dr. Cook, who is an expert on medical device safety, on uh, medical system safety. And he came up with this idea that, excuse me, in his paper, he had this idea that people continuously create safety, which I thought was really interesting. The idea is, even if you, you know, design something as well as you possibly can, you spent you know, a robust SDLC and you try to catch all the bugs, really, you know, it's gonna fail in the field at some point, um, at, like in his, his background, like a medical device, like an infusion pump, uh, it's gonna fail and really then you need the operators of the device and the infrastructure that supports them to really create safety for the whole system of interest, for the system in flight. And so if we think of safety as all the things that could go wrong with the system, um, then we can, you know, malicious or accidental, then we can think of security as a subset of safety. And I think the idea still holds. 
really everyone has to work together to, uh, to create security. So that includes the security team, developers, your reliability engineers, your customer facing engineers, and even sometimes your customers and users. We all have to work together to really create security for the C code in flight. And so the reason I mention this is that this is where optimism really shines. To flip back to a quote from Daniel Kahneman, the main benefit of optimism is resilience in the face of setbacks. So this is anecdotal stuff, but like if you work with an optimism bias in proactive measures, it can be difficult in some cases. So you might hear things like, oh, that's a corner case, you know, that probably won't happen. Or the thing's been like that for months or years, you know, uh, it, it won't get exploited. And this bottom one was a quote from a really good engineer, actually, who I like, he's a friend. Um, but he said, this is talking about a vulnerable service behind a firewall. If that service gets discovered, I'll redact it. Um, so, uh, so, you know, it can be kind of difficult to work with optimism bias and proactive measures, but in reactive measures, it's kind of awesome. So I've seen some really crazy stuff, like um, really like bulletproof incident handling. So I've seen things like, uh, uh, you know, optimists doing things like they, they don't shy away from, from work. So someone, uh, optimists tend not to, to hesitate to report, um, to report issues that might make a lot of work for them. So, for example, you know, if they're going to report a potential you know, security issue that might end up firing up an incident and costing them their whole day or multiple days, they do it because they want to do the right thing and they follow through. I've also seen some insane security remediation skills like, you know, like uh, open heart surgery in the back of a moving bus type stuff. Like, of course, you, at high growth startups in optimistic environments, you tend to have super talented people in it. Their capabilities can really shine in remediation. And then of course, you know, high growth startups tend to skew toward like adrenaline junkies and people that want to do the right things for customers and they really love their brand and they love the people. And so there's usually a relentless commitment to kind of operational resiliency. And so in order to secure C code that seems to work just fine, I think it's really important to secure, excuse me, support secure operations. So uh, this means teaching your customer facing and operational engineers to detect and report potential specifically C-related security issues. So for example, at Fastly, we have training where, excuse me, we talk about what um, a memory disclosure or memory corruption might look like, how to detect it, how to report it, and we even have an exercise where there's like a fake customer report and you have to use production tools to figure out if it's memory corruption or not. So I think that's a great first step, but I don't think it's enough. I think you also really have to participate in creating security. So that means participating in incident commands and response when security issues are found or when vulnerabilities are found in the field. Uh, and, if, and to lead it if you can, to really work as part of the team and understand how it's done. And then of course, the last one might be obvious, but I think it's really important to um, support reporters and incident responders. So it's a key, be, because C vulnerabilities can lead to like catastrophic failures, in order to detect them, you're probably gonna have uh, tuning so that you get some fall po false positives. And so when people report false positives, you need to support them and say, hey, Thank you for reporting that memory disclosure vulnerability. You know, it wasn't an issue. Thank you for reporting it. And don't just tell them, but tell their management as well, because it's really important in uh, securing uh, the system in flight. So to sum everything up, um, there are no real shortcuts. You still have to work toward C security engineering best practices. All the conventional wisdom still applies, even in high growth and optimistic environments. But with that being said, you have to think like an op entrepreneur. Everyone around you is working super hard toward their goals. And so you need to work super hard toward yours. You know, work shoulder to shoulder with them. Do things like, you know, try an MVP process. You don't have to stand up a perfect security control, but start with something and iterate. And then finally, it's important, I think, to leverage the strengths of optimism for security. So this means specifically, um, you know, teaching folks what C vulnerabilities and exploitation are going to look like in the field, and then working with them and remediating it. And that was super fast. Thanks, everyone, very much for your time. I don't know if we have a few minutes for questions. Okay, Thank, thanks everyone.